So today I'd like to welcome everybody to a demonstration of DNA Star's um, SeqMan engine and ArrayStar software on uh, a data set that I think represents our, our uh, capabilities quite well. Um, and I'll introduce uh, the company with a little bit of a, a slideshow, so just, just a few slides here, and then we'll move right into the software. Um, if you do have questions at all, uh, feel free to chat them in, and uh, I'll try to answer them. Uh, sometimes I can do a little bit on the fly if I see them come in, but I can also uh, answer them uh, at the end. We'll have a few minutes at, at the end of the presentation to uh, answer any questions that you do have. So DNA Star is a company located in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, all of our uh, developers and sales staff are located here. Uh, we, we do have a few people outside the office. Um, it's a nice advantage for us. Uh, the, so we can support our customers that have questions um, um, because we can always go right to developers, the people that wrote the software. Uh, so we have a nice uh, um, network that we can support our customers with. DNA Star uh, really has been a pioneer in genomics. Um, I, I have a little snapshot here of a paper from 1997 from Science, and uh, this is uh, the primary author is Dr. Frederick Plattner, who is the owner of DNA Star. Uh, and, and a number of the people that are on this paper are still scientists at DNA Star. They still have input for uh, developing software. So we've been in this business a long time, and we've always focused on developing software to meet the needs of uh, molecular biologists, and really it's desktop software. So the idea is to make the software accessible to the researcher so they don't have to necessarily rely on a core facility or a bioinformatics team to do their analysis. Um, so I'll be showing you software that can do both assembly and downstream analysis um, on, on a workflow. Uh, because we've been in the business for quite some time, uh, DNA Star software uh, is the most uh, cited in, in literature. And this is just a, a graph showing, uh, you know, all the way back to 1985, uh, uh, almost 8,000 citations. And now this is a, a couple years old, so we'll be, I'm sure, updating this soon um, with even more publications and citations of our software. And so we've been in the, in the business for a long time. We have a very large and loyal user base, both in the U.S. Uh, and overseas. And uh, much of this software um, over the past 26 years has been our laser gene core suite, which is a, which is a more basic set of molecular biology tools. Um, we've since then added additional tools. So, so if you're joining us today and you're an existing customer and you have laser gene software, uh, we will be discussing some of the new software that you can add uh, to incorporate some of the uh, new sequencing technologies. So our software, again, it's desktop. It's powerful and it's easy to use, and that's that's really what our goal is. Um, our our main assembler is called Seekman Engine. Uh, Seekman Engine software is a 64-bit program. It runs on Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, we've designed it to be as flexible as possible, and so we can assemble Illumina, Ion Torrent, Roche 454, and Pack Biodata, and that includes uh, different versions of their own data. So you'll have a few different file formats: single end, paired end, mate pair data. And uh, we try to make a tool that can encompass as many different sequencing platforms as possible. And many researchers actually use more than one sequencing technology. There are advantages in some cases to combine different technologies. Um, you may have sources of data from multiple core facilities. And of course, different data types work better for different types of projects. And so our goal is to provide a software that can really uh, accommodate as many different platforms and workflows as possible. Um, so our SeqMan engine is the workhorse for assembling the data, taking the FASTQ files and assembling them, but we also have some very nice analysis tools. And we'll spend some time today looking at uh, the, some of the capabilities in those tools. And that will be in our SeqMan software, which is part of the Laser Gene Core Suite. Again, if you're a long-term customer, uh, you may already have access to the SeqMan software as part of your Laser Gene Core Suite. Uh, and then we also have our ArrayStar software that we'll uh, take a look at. Um, our capacity for the software is, is very, very high. Um, and we can analyze, we designed it to assemble and analyze multiple genomes or exomes concurrently. 
Um, and and that that's very nice for desktop computing. A lot of times, folks using other softwares will have to resort to things like Linux clusters, um, very expensive uh, computers. Um, our software is designed to run on computers that can be you know, under 5000 or in some cases under $3,000. And of course, we provide great technical support with every purchase. And that's part of my role at DNA Star is that I focus on the next-gen customers. So if you do have questions um, or very difficult projects that you need some assistance on, our service plan that's provided with our software uh, gives you access to myself and other folks at DNA Star. Um, oftentimes we will look at projects, uh, work through problems together, uh, do webinars like this, but one-on-one -on -one webinars, and, and we can get you through uh, any difficult uh, uh, problem that you might encounter. So one of the first questions that comes up when we start talking about desktop software and next-gen sequencing sets, um, some people are quite skeptical that a desktop computer can perform well enough or even outperform Linux clusters with these larger data sets. And so I have a, a benchmark table here, and it just shows some of the data sets that, that we test with a variety of sequencing platforms. And at the top, I have a, a human genome data set um, using Illumina technology. And this is about 3.5 billion Illumina reads with a coverage across the genome of 36x. And our assembly time is 23 hours, about 23 and a half hours on this genome. And actually, that assembly time um, is, is actually quite a bit faster than that. Um, it's somewhere in the range of 15 to 16 hours. Um, but we also do quite a bit of file, uh, quite a bit of analysis um, in this assembly time. So this is including things like um, doing all the statistical SNP analysis and generating all the SNP files, uh, doing GURP calculations. And we produce a BAM file output that contains a whole host of accessory files that makes analysis of this genome uh, a lot more efficient and a lot um, easier than if you just had a plain BAM file. So we're doing a lot in this 23 and a half hours here. Um, smaller projects, things like exomes, um, this might be a billion reads or so, somewhere in that range. Um, this is a project that has, and this is a project that we're going to look at today. It's eight human exomes. Uh, it takes about 14 hours to assemble. And so that's roughly, if you do one exome at a time, roughly two hours per exome. If you batch them together in a multiplexed experiment uh, or a multiplex assembly, um, you can save some time. So 14 hours to do these eight exomes. And these are deep coverage. You know, we're getting near 500x coverage on many of the exons. So this is a, a very hefty data set and a very, very fast time on a desktop. Some of the other data sets, uh, some ion torrent data with our Ampliseq cancer panel, you know, a couple of hours. Again, this is a very deep alignment, 1,000x coverage. And some of the smaller genomes, like a Arabidopsis and a fungal genome, you know, it might be an hour or just several minutes to do the assembly. And of course, uh, just a couple of minutes for things like E. coli. Um, RNA-seq, uh, another workflow that can be highly variable in the number of sets that you have, experimental conditions, and the amount of coverage that you have. Um, so this particular experiment, 332 million reads, about three hours. Again, so these are, are really nice uh, uh, assembly times, and I think that these times will stand up to even you know softwares running on Linux clusters and very powerful computers. And and we can do this on a Dell computer that's under three grand. And and if you are interested in the software, we can certainly talk hardware. Um, uh, you can contact DNA Star. We can give you uh, exact specifications. Um, de novo assemblies, uh, a little bit different. They require uh, more RAM, so it's a different flavor of our algorithm. And depending on how big the data set is, you may have uh, some different assembly times. Um, most of our de novo assemblies are microbial and small eukaryotic assemblies. Um, if you have a lot of RAM on a computer, um, then you might do smaller to mid-sized eukaryotes. Um, our software is also commonly used for de novo transcriptome assemblies and it performs quite well. And those are some of the more difficult of all assemblies because we can have a mix of, of uh, um, cDNAs that are present at varying um, abundances, and that creates contigs of widely varying depths. Many assemblers reject that type of an, uh, de novo assembly. Our SeqMan engine does an excellent job. Um, and it usually takes a couple of, anywhere from two to six hours to do that assembly. But really, for de novo assemblies, it's not so much the time that it takes to do the assembly. It's more, you know, what is the quality of the output? 
and it can be very difficult uh, to ex assess the quality. So we like to do things like uh, align genomes that have been closed and finished so we can check the accuracy of our contigs. Um, and then with transcriptomes, there are some other kind of metrics that you can use. Um, there's actually been a couple of, of, of recent papers from BMC Genomics um, from two different groups that compared SeqMan Engine. And, and when they did the comparison, it wasn't so much on how fast the program was, but really on the accuracy of the contigs that were generated. And doing things like looking for open reading frames and blasting results and confirming um, that the contigs actually were not chimeric, but you know, single cDNAs in this case. Um, and in these two papers, uh, one compared uh, Engine with commercial and open source on 454. The other, it was de novo Illumina assembly of transcriptome data. And of course, uh, we have copies of these papers on our website. Just to sum up, SeqMan Engine performed uh, best overall amongst all these assemblers. Um, and then there's a number of different criteria um, uh, by which these were based. And so we have very fast reference guided assemblies. Our de novo assembler is very stringent, very accurate. Again, these all run on desktop computers. Um, one last slide here. Uh, these are just some, some customer comments that we have. And you, you can see some of the nice comments, you know, powerful software. Um, but really one of the most consistent uh, pieces of feedback that we get is customers are really appreciate assistance that they get. They purchase the software. You know, they've got a deadline to make for a poster pa paper presentation, and they need to analyze data. And uh, the tech support people here um, can really help out um, researchers that are using the software and train them on how to use the software, and then also troubleshoot uh, when a problem does arise. So with that, I'd like to move out of the PowerPoint and launch our SeekMan Engine software. So SeekMan Engine, again, is a 64-bit program. It runs on Mac PC and Linux. And um, there's a couple of different ways to actually run the software. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is the, we call it the wizard, and it allows us to set up a wide variety of different project types. And hopefully we've designed this so that it's easy to make the correct selections and you get the assembly that you need. Um, advanced users can also run SeqMan Engine from the command line using a script. So if you have a need to have higher throughput and need to run, say, 25 assemblies over the weekend, there are ways to do that with SeqMan Engine. So this first page, um, we have a couple different entry points. We can start from scratch, create a new assembly project, or I can load an existing script file. So if I ran an assembly a month ago and I've forgotten what parameters I used, I can load that script file and rerun the same assembly. So that's a really nice feature. Uh, I can also import a BAM file. So if in your uh, sequence pipeline, um, you have BAM files that are layout alignment files from another alignment engine. Um, you can import that BAM file, and SeqMan Engine will process it further. And what it's going to do is add gaps, do statistical SNP analysis, create an output that will be much uh, usable in our very nice analysis tools. And so there's a couple different entry points, but we'll, we'll just start with a new project here. And we can choose the project type. Uh, you can see that we've got um, genome assemblies, targeted resequencing and exome, um, transcriptome assembly, um, metagenomic and population assemblies. So as I make these selections, what starts to happen is that we'll have a, a different set of optimal parameters then for each type of a workflow. And it will actually give us different options here at the end as well. If I pick genome assembly and click next, um, I'll have three options. I can have the normal templated workflow that gives me a BAM file. Um, I have a special workflow, so if I'm using Engine to align data and uh, to one genome with the purpose of, of sequencing a novel strain, then I can create an editable SeqMan output um, and begin to reconstruct the novel strain, or I can do a de novo assembly. And so these decisions then change a bit as we select different workflows. Targeted resequencing means that we have a reference sequence, so I just have two options. And I'm going to pick the, the standard output, which is the BAM output. Um, and the BAM output has some really nice advantages. It's a, it's a very efficient file format so that I can have very large data sets, billions of reads in a project, um, and then still open it on a laptop computer 
and do analysis. So the BAM file is an incredibly efficient um, way to view and analyze a very large data set. Um, however, they are not editable. So that means I can't go in and make micro edits or split contigs or do that sort of uh, work. If, if I need to do that, I have the Seekman editable format, um, which has a, a limitation on project size. So it's mostly used for microbes and small eukaryotic assemblies. Uh, now I can set up my project files. Um, this tells us where to put the output data and also which um, region on my computer I want to process temporary files. So I have a project name here, and then I pick a project folder. Um, this is my output folder then that my BAM assembly files will uh, be deposited here in addition to some accessory files. Uh, the temporary file location, um, this is an indication of, of what the algorithm is doing. And so depending on my data set, and I can go to our website here and get some, and here's some of the hardware specs. I'll just scroll down a bit. For reference guided assemblies, we can see that we generally recommend a computer with 16 gigs of RAM and you know, a quad core processor. So any newer Windows machine uh, will very easily meet these specs. And in fact, the new processors that were released recently, the Sandy Bridge processors, the i7s, um, perform really, really well and gave us a big performance boost. So these budget processors that can run at you know three and a half to four gigahertz um, allowed us to accelerate our assembly times by 20 to 30 percent. So uh, again, these are budget computers. You see, the only difference here is the disk for temporary files. So if I have a human genome, which is the largest of the data sets that we'll do, and something that's small like yeast, it's uh, I need more space to process temporary files. Now these files um, aren't saved. They are you know, while we're processing the data, while Engine is working through the template files, through the hundreds of millions or billions of reads, um, it'll, it'll create temporary files and then remove them when the assembly is done. So this is really a scratch disk space. Um, and again, these can be internal drives. Um, if you have a computer that has space to put a rated drive, or it can be an external stack. Um, of hard drives that you plug in with a USB 3 or eSATA connection, a fast transfer of, of data. And so that's really the, the main hardware requirement is make sure that you have enough disk space and a reasonably fast processor. And then the algorithm will flex. If you have more or less RAM, it can flex quite a bit and accommodate uh, the type of hardware that you, that they, that you have. Uh, template files. So this is what I want to align my data against. Um, you can use a variety of different files, you know, FASTA files, GenBank-style files. Um, if you're working in one of the main uh, model organisms, um, I recommend using one of our genome packages. And you see there's a download link where we can uh, download uh, or, or get a genome template package for human, mouse, rat, cow, uh, a number of the model organisms. You can request additional. So if you're working in an organism where we haven't made a package, uh, we can create one. It takes a few days on our end, but we can put one together for you. Um, the reason that we like these packages is that they contain lots of information. And I have it on my data drive here. And so a genome template package will have a couple of things. It will have the sequences, and these are the GenBank files. So here's human chromosomes plus some uh, unlocated contigs. Then we also have dbSNP database. So these are um, the most current version, this is 135, I believe. It looks like it's in the name here. And these are all dbSNP databases for each chromosome. We've also included a cancer database, which is the cosmic database, and then an evolutionary relationship database called GURP. And so we have a GURP database. Um, this can change. So as new databases become available that have different subsets or variants, um, we can add them to these genome template packages. And, and build them for you. And so the advantage here, the reason that I want to have dbSNP up front is that with the very large data sets, when you have hundreds of millions or billions of reads, um, it's a big advantage to begin the variant analysis as the data is streaming through the assembler on your big computer. Um, you don't want to run a SNP report or try to generate a SNP report on your laptop on a human genome. You know, It could take hours or days just to, to generate that report. So we'll generate SNP files 
Um, as the data is streaming through, to tell you which SNPs hit at DB SNP locations and start applying p-values and statistical measures. Uh, then we load our sequence files in, and we have Illumina data, 454, Ion Torrent, a number of different platforms that we can select from. And really, when you start making these selections, um, the different platforms, uh, you, you know, have different error rates different lengths, different types of quality scores. They may handle paired data differently. And so as we make these selections, uh, this really starts to set different default alignment parameters depending on the platform that you choose. And so uh, this really uh, will change our defaults uh, that will be specific to this data type. Um, in this example, I've loaded three FASTQ files that are Illumina data. And FASTQ is a pretty standard format. It's typically the Illumina-like, where we'll have base scores and then quality scores in ASCII code. Um, Ion Torrent and 454 also have SFF files, which we are compatible with. Um, and so those are the two predominant formats um, for, for data. There are some older formats that we accept as well. Uh, this particular uh, alignment is going to be a multiplex. So these are three different samples. And I check this box, and I can click this box, and this gives us an interface now where we can type in and define what our different samples are. And so now I have an African, Asian, and European group. Um, I might have a hundred different files here, or I might have several dozen. I can define the group name. I may have multiple FASTQ files per set or per sample. Uh, this interface allows me to customize it. Um, when I have ion torrent or Illumina data um, that's been multiplexed, um, typically that data will be demultiplexed using the pipeline software um, associated with the sequencing instrument. And that, that's actually a good decision on, on their part. Um, oftentimes barcodes change, uh, people have custom barcodes, and Oftentimes that information is lost as the data ends up you know, in the end user's hand, and it can be difficult to demultiplex if you don't know exactly which barcodes are used. And so with Illumina and Ion Torrent, um, each barcoded sample will be in a separate FASTQ file. Uh, with 454 data, it is a bit different. They use MID tags. Um, in that case, if I have 454 data, our software recognizes all the known MID tags, or at least what we've seen to date. And so if you have 454, our software will look for the MID tag, bin the data by MID tag, trim, and then assemble, and then keep track of the group name. So, so we do accommodate uh, both types of barcoded data. Uh, then we have some assembly options. Um, these are some of the basic options here, um, MER size, minimum match percentage, um, and then we also ask input for the, the ploidy of the genome. And the one thing that I do change on a fairly regular basis is the minimum match percentage. And the minimum match percentage is the percent that the overall read must match the reference sequence in order for it to align to the reference sequence. So you can imagine if I lower this stringency to 80%, that will allow a lot more mismatch. Um, for some data sets, you need to do that. If your reference isn't very close to your sequence strain, for instance, you can lower the stringency and get more of your reads to align. If you go too low, you start to get non-specific alignment, which, which can be bad. Uh, so, so typically, this is something that I will adjust and try higher or lower match percentages if I have a certain problem that I need to work out. The default of 93, we've optimized on hundreds of assemblies. Um, and so it's a, it's a very nice starting point. Um, but it is the one thing, if you want to change your assembly, that's the one parameter you look to first. Uh, the genome ploidy uh, is used by our statistical SNP caller. Um, we use a Bayesian statistical method, and uh, it's a slightly different algor algorithm for diploids, haploids. Um, when we choose population or other, we do not apply statistics. Instead, we look at the depth of coverage and the quality scores at the SNPs. Typically, these are deep assemblies where it's a mixed population of sequences. Um, we will be adding additional statistics to accommodate cancer data sets um, and some other types of essentially populations um, uh, later this year. 
There's also some advanced options. I won't, I won't go through all these in detail, um, but there's some layout options here. I can limit the input reads. There's some more knobs and dials I could adjust to fine-tune the assembly. Um, it's very rare when we have to make changes here. Um, usually it's when we get some non-standard data that isn't the typical uh, alumina or ion torrent data, then maybe we make some adjustments here. Again, this is where having access to uh, the developers at DNA Star, uh, the algorithmists that wrote these algorithms, um, can make suggestions on particular projects. Um, it's pretty rare when we have to do that, but it does happen on occasion. There's also some advanced SNP options, so we can see that we're doing a diploid Bayesian method here. We're calculating SNPs by default. Um, and then there's some filtering that occurs. Again, for these large uh, data sets, exomes and whole genomes, um, there's a fair amount of sequencing noise. In fact, it can be um, sequencing errors that occur at very low percentages that you want to remove from your SNP analysis. And so we do some very minimal um, thresholding at the bottom level to remove SNPs that occur at very low percentages, very low p-scores, and very low base quality scores. And so that reduces the size of the SNP files that are generated to make them just more manageable so they import faster um, and so forth. Now, um, we can also, if I take population here, so if I have something that's not diploid or haploid, um, then we're not applying the statistics and we, we're only going to filter on minimum SNP percentage. I can also remove that filter. So, for example, if I have a cancer data set or any other data set where I'm looking for rare variants that might only occur you know, at 1% or less, um, I can pick a population, remove all filtering altogether, and get a list of all the possible uh, variants. So once you've gone through the wizard, and I'll just kind of, you'll see that it's, it's mostly basic choices here. Create a project, targeted resequencing, stick with defaults, template file, sequence data. Um, I stuck with all defaults here for alignment options. Um, what's actually happening with this wizard is we're writing a text script of instruction then for the assembler. And we can view this text script in this uh, interface. I, I can also save the script by clicking this button. There's also some additional parameters here that are actually used by the assembler, S some more things here. And when I click Assemble, it's going to automatically save the script, and the assembly will begin. And I always want to watch here. It tells me how much free space I have. I've got six terabytes on this computer. Um, if my if my disks aren't awake, sometimes my hard drives are in semi dormant state, especially the first thing in the in the morning, and I might get an error right away, and it just says you know disk not available. And sometimes it's just a matter of waking it up a little bit, and we're good to go. But we can see now that the assembler is starting to go through building MER files, and I'm going to launch my task manager here. And now with WebEx running like this, sometimes uh, we, Hopefully I won't cut out on you, but I'll, I'll stop the assembly before it gets too far. But we can see the assembler is called XNG, and this is an eight-core computer. So one core will be 13%, and we can see how much, how much memory is used. And we'll see in burst, now we're at 98% of my CPUs. And so this software is really optimized to use every bit of hardware on your computer to get the fastest possible assembly times. So uh, I probably can't do, I can check my email, run a webinar. I wouldn't want to run another assembly at the same time on this computer, um, but it's going to give me the best possible performance here. And it's going to use a chunk of RAM. Right now it's about 7.5 gigs of RAM. And so it will balance the CPU usage with the RAM with um, disk space. And again, if your computer has more or less RAM, it will dip more or less heavily. If your processors are faster or slower, it will utilize more or less processor. So it's a really great algorithm um, to, to maximize performance on these desktop computers. If we go back to the assembly log, you can, we can track the progress here. So if I have problems with, say, file formats, or I don't really have a FASTQ file, but some other file that looked like a FASTQ, um, I may get some errors here. 
um, that we can read and we can export the log. Again, send that to DNA Star and we can uh, troubleshoot and help figure out what, what the data problem is. So it's very common to have file format issues, at least initially, when you run your first assemblies. Um, and then we, we let this finish. Um, once it's done, now we won't let this one finish, but there, the screen will change here. I'll have the whole log. And then I'll have a button where I can launch the assembly in Seekman Pro. And so I'm going to cancel this. And we'll stop this assembly here. Um, let's see, where are we here with it? And I think we're done. Okay. Matt, is this a good time to ask some questions? I think so. Yeah, that would be great. If, if there are some questions here, I can certainly answer them. We do have a few. Uh, one is about the genome template packages, a specific question about whether or not we have one for uh, Xenopus. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I believe it's a genus Af of frog. African clawed frog. Um, we do not have one yet, but that's something. Uh, what, what we would do is uh, go to the dbSNP uh, page at NCBI and just confirm that, that the Xenopus SNPs are curated um, in dbSNP so that there's enough there to warrant making a package, and we, we could certainly generate one for you. Great, thank you. And another question about um, ion torrent data. Someone's getting into a genome sequencing project of a five megabase bacterial genome for with ion torrent, and wondering if we have tools for analyzing that kind of data. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we've we've received many different uh, ion torrent data sets for E. coli genomes in the past couple of years. So we've got. Um, actually three different types of data. We have their single end data, um, also their mate pair data, which has roughly 10 KB inserts. Um, and we can use, our software can use, in a de novo assembly, can use the mate pair data to um, order contigs into scaffolds, um, and then we can visualize the scaffolds, and we have a whole host of tools for closing the genome and adding annotations. A third type of data is their paired end, and we can do correction with ion torrent paired end data where the pairs overlap, generate a consensus, and get a better assembly. So, yeah, we'll, we'll work very well with ion torrent um, genome data. Great. Thank you. There are more questions coming in, but I think I'll let you move on, and we'll follow up with people after the webinar if we don't get to your questions. Okay, great. So, when the assembly is done, you'll have a, a, an option to open directly in Seekman. And Seekman, if I, I can actually show you my my start menu here, is part of the LaserGene 10 core suite. And the LaserGene 10 core suite has a number of different programs in it. Um, Seekman Pro is one of them, uh, but we have other programs that do things like, uh, you know, building clones, designing primers, uh, adding sequence annotations, protein analysis, again, more sophisticated primer design, cluster LW alignments, map making, gene hunting. So it's part of uh, the laser gene core. This is a 32-bit program. You do not have to have a 64-bit operating system to run it. Um, and again, um, you may have access to the software. It's been uh, available for quite some time. Um, so your institute may already have Seekman. So the idea is that for existing customers, at least, if you have LaserGene Core and you're moving into next gen, you can purchase a Seekman engine to assemble your data and then get an output that um, you can uh, analyze in your Seekman software. Now the actual output file, actually I should minimize this just for a bit here, and I'm going to show you what the output looks like. and. Here's the output from the assembly that I had run, and it's eight human exomes. You can see it's a big file. This is 65 gigabytes in size, and it's actually a folder here that contains a lot of files in it. And you'll notice that uh, these files are kind of uh, repeated, so it's, it's essentially a set of BAM files and accessories per reference sequence in my assembly. So, there, so this is chromosome 1. Here's the BAM file, it's 4.7 gigs. Of course, it's going to be the biggest. Um, and then there's also a BAM index file. 
the format of these files, the index file and the BAM file, follow the SAM tool specifications. So if you need to bring this BAM file to another point in your pipeline for analysis, you are able to do that. And you could bring this to a BAM file viewer and look at the BAM file. Uh, the other files that we've created are um, things like SNPs. We call them missing SNPs, but SNPs that are uh, absent from some of the samples, um, coverage information. We have uh, feature information, gaps in the template. We build all these accessory files so that when you do your BAM file analysis in Seekman, it's going to perform vastly better than a BAM file in a, in a viewer program. And so we build this set of accessory files, package them up. It makes the BAM file uh, that much better. And so here's a BAM file, uh, this assembly file in Seekman. On the first window that you'll see, actually it will be these two windows. Um, here's a list of my chromosomes, chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, and so forth. You can see the length, uh, the number of reads out of a line. That's 67 million, 54 million. So this is a lot of data that we have uh, showing here. Um, the report file, I won't go through all the details here, but the report file gives me some of the metrics on the alignment. So again, this is a piece of information that we might use for troubleshooting. You know, I can see how many sequences um, late, uh, missed the template, had at least one MER hit, and I can also see how many bad sequences there were, um, and then how many sequences actually exported out, and I'll just highlight that, um, to the BAM file. And this is about 701 million sequences um, were exported to the BAM format. I also get uh, a script so I can see how the assembly was run. And so that's some of the information here. That's under project report. Um, and then this is the window that shows the contigs. I can highlight this header and generate reports then for the entire assembly. So what I've done here is I've highlighted the header and gone and generated a SNP report. And so what we're reviewing here is the SNP report then for all eight of these exomes um, all together. And so we have uh, a number of different columns in the SNP report, and this really becomes the um, analysis interface for you know, a BAM file, large BAM file in our software. And so there's a number of different columns here, and I can explain what they are. Um, and then also at the top of this table are the filters that we can apply. Um, there's still some filtering that we'll need to do. Uh, we, we did a little bit of filtering at the assembler. There's more filtering that we need to do to separate noise from the signal that we're interested in. And I did apply some of the filters ahead of time. When, when I first opened this report, there was something like 400 million possible SNPs. And so I filtered it down by applying some minimal threshold in here. So a couple things that I did is minimum percentages. Only show me SNPs that occur between 20 and 100%. Um, the depth of 10, so only variants occurring where I have a coverage of 10 or more. And I'm also only showing SNPs that are within 25 base pairs of a coding feature. And then I increase the probability to 90 from the default of 50. And so these are user, uh, you, you can change these. I'm also showing novel SNPs. I can say show the annotated SNPs only. And this will be a list of SNPs that have a DB SNP RS number. So I can toggle between annotated and novel SNPs. I can also show all the SNPs. And here's all the SNPs in this particular project. Um, I can also filter to show SNPs that are coding SNPs only, that are coding change. Um, that have nonsense. So there's a number of different ways I can, depending on what I'm interested in, filter the SNP report um, to find variants of interest. Um, now the columns that are here also are customizable. If I right click at the, the header, I can show or hide a number of different columns. Again, depending on my data source, I may make some disappear. And now I'll just kind of describe what the columns are. Uh, the first column is um, whether or not the SNP has been verified. Have I looked at it, um, verified that it is, is in fact a SNP? If I check on it, make a check mark, um, that actually verifies a SNP at that location. And um, when I do verify a SNP, I can also update my SNP database. So there's some interface here where I can append the checked user SNPs. 
Um, what that's doing then is I might decide that I really want to look for novel SNPs. And so these aren't in dbSNP. There's no RS number here. And I might use Seekman Engine then to uh, the assembly here to go to my assembly. And I can see one of my samples, one of my European exomes, has a T to C SNP. And I might verify and look at the alignment here to see do I think that's a real SNP or not. In this case, I'm going to say that looks like a real SNP. And so when I check it, that makes an annotation there. And I can append my checked user SNPs. And when I click that, it will just build to my DB SNP database. It will create a little custom database. So it's a way to um, add SNPs to a little custom database file so that the next time I run data sets, I can then distinguish between SNPs and dbSNP, SNPs that I've verified on additional data sets that are novel and not in dbSNP yet. Uh, the next column is the MID column, which uh, tells me which sample the SNP is occurring in. Um, I also get a contig ID, tells me which contig. I get a contig and reference position, which are going to be different due to gapping, um, whether it's a SNP or an indel a reference base, a call base, a genotype call. Um, the splice column tells me, is the SNP near an exon, um, and is it in a splicing motif? So it might affect um, intron exon splicing. I get an impact call on the type of SNP, um, the percentage that it occurs, um, then a p-value, the probability that that alignment is not the reference. So in this example, it's almost 100%, so the peanut ref is going to, going to be 100 because it's such a strong homozygous SNP. Um, then we also get the DB SNP ID, and I'm just going to scroll a little bit more here. Again, the DB SNP ID, if I show annotated SNPs, I can open DB SNP, so there's an RS number. And I can go right to that information uh, about that SNP directly at NCBI with a link from our software. Um, the GURP score, which is a genome evolutionary score, um, these are calculated through alignments of multiple humans, primates, other mammals. And it's in both coding and non-coding regions. So it's similar. There are other databases like Polyfen. Uh, I think SIFT is another one. Um, that do some similar things. GURP is nice because it goes outside of the coding regions, goes into non-coding areas as well. Uh, it's not every location in the genome, but it's most locations. And we get a score then based on these alignments of multiple primates and mammals for how conserved individual nucleotides are. And the higher the number, the higher the GURP score, the more conserved that location is. So it's it's a nice way to potentially um, differentiate between large numbers of SNPs um, um, using a GURP score. Um, there's also feature type here, um, feature name, and I'll just go DNA change, protein change, depth, and then the allele breakdown. So it's a great interface. It allows me to be interactive with my alignment view. And the alignment view then, and these are really deep exomes, so you can see in this alignment view, I can collapse everything down. Um, I can expand. So if I click this top, I'll call it a twisty triangle for lack of a better term. Um, here's my reference sequence. And I can see the annotations in my reference sequence. Here's a, a consensus at the top. I can convert to reference coordinates by clicking this box rather than the consensus. So it's a really nice, powerful view um, for um, analyzing a project like this. And what I have collapsed here, here's my eight exomes, and I can see um, these yellow highlighted regions are what we call a pseudo-consensus. And it's not a true consensus, but it's showing me the variant call in a collapsed form. So I can quickly see that you know the SNP that I've highlighted only occurs in the first African individual. And then, of course, the great part is I can expand this by clicking and a little bit of adjustment here, and I can actually look at the assembled data. So it's, it's an excellent view, 
and the capacity is tremendous. This is a very large project. And if I go to my task manager and look at Seekman, oops, I missed there. It's moving. There we go. Um, you can see I'm using less than a gigabyte of RAM on a project that contains you know, almost you know, three-quarters of a billion reads in it. And so I can open this on a laptop computer. It might take a few minutes to load the project, but once it's loaded, the memory footprint is very small. And again, that's attributed to the BAM format. Um, the way BAM formats work is only what you see on this screen is what's in the memory. And so it allows me to have these large assemblies uh, work efficiently. So now, on this type of analysis, um, you can see that we can look at each sample and we can see where the SNPs are. And the SNP report does allow us to do some comparisons. Um, but if I want to do additional levels of analysis, for instance, if I want to know, uh, you know, a question for this type of experiment might be, do the African, Asian, and European individuals have SNPs in common or SNPs that are unique to that set? Um, you can, if, if you have just a couple of genes of interest, um, you could do it right here in SeqMan. And you know, I could find my gene of interest, scroll to it, look at the alignment view, and get my information that way. But if you've got thousands of SNPs or very large projects, um, we have another tool that can do that sort of analysis. Um, and that's in our ArrayStar software. And I'll, I'll just launch a, an ArrayStar here. While you're doing that, Matt, a couple more questions have come up. We're actually getting a lot of questions coming in, and I don't know that we'll have time for all of them, but okay. we'll get to a couple. Um, what kind of assembly would you recommend, uh, de novo or templated, to identify large insertions and deletions in E. coli? Um, so if, if you're doing E. coli work, then um, you're going to have a lot of reference sequences to choose from. And so what I would recommend, well, there's a couple things. Um, we have a metagenomic pathway. Um, in engine. So if I don't know what my best reference is, I might align to all E. coli genomes and related genomes that, um, that I can collect and then sort my reads to all the genomes at once. And that only takes an hour or so with engine. Figure out what the best reference sequence is. Um, then we can align our data to that best reference sequence. And we have some structural variant analysis tools, so uh, reads that um, for instance, that span across deletions, we can split them, generate a, a report to show you know where those deletions occur. Insertions look different; um, they have their own kind of uh, uh, morphology, and we can detect those automatically as well. Um, now, I should mention uh, there, there are some new tools that we're working on. They aren't available uh, right now, but the plan is this September. Uh, to have some automated uh, tools to recognize structural variants in microbial assemblies and then do de novo assembly across those areas. So in deletions, you might merge. In insertions, you do de novo assembly. Again, right now we can do that manually, but we're going to have some automated tools designed specifically for microbes that will make that work a lot easier. Um, and that's something we can talk about here in the next couple of months in more detail. And uh, just quickly, I know we only have about 10 minutes left, but how does our software compare to uh, other freely available software for de novo and templated assemblies? Um, so, so comparing softwares is always uh, tremendously difficult. Uh, it's just a huge task for any, you know, any one person to try to undertake it. So most of the feedback that I get is just from customers that have been using uh, different softwares. Um, the, the biggest, there's two primary differences. One, open source software is usually designed for very specific purposes. For instance, there is specific software that does de novo assembly of short read Illumina data. That same software cannot do long read, and it may not also do ion torrent or templated assemblies. So if you're using all open source tools and, and you have a variety of projects, you may have to master a number of fairly difficult to use Linux algorithms. And that becomes a, a very difficult uh, task. Whereas Seekman Engine, the algorithm will flex. It accommodates a wide variety of different types of, pro of projects and platforms. So it's a lot easier to use in that sense. Um, Engine also produces better results than most of the open source algorithms. So um, you'll get better de novo assemblies that are more accurate. The contigs will be more accurate. Your templated assemblies will also place more reads 
and um, do it faster. I guess the third thing I would mention is support really is a big difference. When you're using open source software, you may not get any support other than online forums, which may or may not be accurate information for you. Um, with DNA Star software, you can contact myself, the other scientists here, and really get top-notch support on all the different projects that you're doing. Great. Thank you. Okay, great. So I have just a couple more things to show here, and then uh, I'll take some more questions at the end. Um, so Array Star, uh, just a little background on Array Star, was originally designed as microarray software. And uh, soon after it was released for microarray, we started to see some RNA seq projects. So we built an alignment uh, engine in it that's similar, in fact, to what Seqman Engine can do. So it could take sequence data, align it, uh, apply normalization to generate expression values, and then, then it's like microarray. You have an expression value per gene, and you can make comparisons across multiple sets. Um, it also grew to bring in databases, ontology information, uh, feature information in database format. So it's, it's well designed to bring in massive amounts of data in table form. Well, that's exactly what SNP reports are, variant reports, and that we generate in SeqMan. And so while we were designing our human genome assembler, uh, we had a need to be able to compare early versions of the software. And as we improved the algorithm, we needed to be able to quickly compare the variants that we had against our uh, known HapMap database to know if our assembler was getting better or worse as we were working on it. Um, the tool, we designed it in ArrayStar. It worked very, very well, so we commercialized it. And now it is a, uh, a part of our software. Um, so we can do things like start SNP projects, and an interface will come up. I can directly import my Seekman engine project or files from other sources and pull them into ArrayStar. And I won't go through all those steps. It takes a couple of minutes to pull all those in. And I'll just, let's see here. And so here's our 8 exome project. You can see that Eraser automatically will recognize uh, the eight conditions. Um, and so we have this list of experiments, and we get a SNP table. And the SNP table now is, even though it's still as big, um, it is actually a summary of the Seekman SNP table. And you can see the main difference here is now we have our, here's chromosome 1. We get a reference position. We get a gene name the reference call, <coughs> excuse me, and here's our samples, and here's the called seek um, in each sample. And so we're actually getting a summary then at the reference position. If you remember back with SeekMan, um, if we look at these reference positions, I'll just scroll here to the left a little bit. You can see that for a number of these SNPs, we've actually got three rows for a variant call at the same position in three of our samples. And so it's a very flat report, um, so it doesn't condense anything in any way. But when we go to ArrayStar, um, now we have essentially a summary at each reference position, reference call, the call on each one of the samples. Um, I've also added some columns. And so if there's some quick buttons up here, and I can populate this table with a number of things. It can be the called seek, contact position, genotype, protein change, um, and that will be for each experiment, the reference sequence, gene name, cosmic ID, dbSNP, GURP score. So I can make this table look however I want it to pull in the type of information that I want. So I've got the called sequence, the dbSNP ID, and GURP score. There's some GURP scores here as well. Um, now I can also... Uh, depending on what I'm doing, I can also fill in and bring in information that's missing information, and that's the missing SNPs that I mentioned briefly in the in the BAM assembly package. So, you know, if a SNP is missing because there was no coverage, or it's the same as a reference sequence, um, at the exome scale, that's a massive amount of information. So, it, you may or may not want to bring that into your experiment, depending on the size of your experiment. Um, I didn't for this particular experiment, but we, it is possible to populate these. Now, um, I do need to filter this. There's still lots of SNPs here. And if I want to make a comparison to find, okay, which SNPs are in common and which are unique, um, I can apply multiple filters. 
And so there's an interface here where I can filter at both the gene and the SNP level. And this is very flexible interface. I can pick the experiments that I want to filter. And so what I did in this case is I, I created sets. I created sets for the African group, the Asian, and the European group. So I selected which, and then I choose some criteria. And there's an interface here that uh, allows for just about any possible kind of filter. Um, I can filter for genotype. Um, I can filter for non-synonymous versus, versus synonymous SNPs. And then apply some additional filtering like we had in SeqMan, filter by group scores, um, DB SNP database. I can check the, D, the, the database. Or if I have a custom database, I can filter against that. So it's a um, fairly uh, um, sophisticated filtering that I can apply. And that will create a set. And I can save that set by clicking a button here um, and to, to actually make that set. And then I get a set list. And so here's a set list of the African, Asian, and European variants. And you can see there's some notes in the details section where it tells me what kind of filters I use and how many SNPs. So I can create these sets. And once the sets are created, uh, then I can make comparisons between sets. And that's where we have Venn diagrams. Um, and, and in this case, we have a simple uh, um, three condition Venn diagram. We can actually do a dartboard diagram. If I have um, multiple or more than three, I can make additional Venn diagrams. And I can select any part of the Venn diagram and make, do analysis just on those subsections. And so if I want to look at the SNPs that are in common, I can select the ABC and create a, a gene table of that. And here's a list of the genes that are involved with all the SNPs that are in common. And so with this gene table then, you can see I've imported more information. I now have um, Go IDs. So this is annotation information from the Go Consortium that was brought into the project. Um, I can do uh, bring in values that show how disrupted the gene is by the SNPs. So there's a number of different uh, analyses I can do at this gene level, uh, including bringing in uh, the gene ontology, and uh, I can do uh, ontology comparisons on my gene set of interest. So just kind of scratching the surface here with the Ray Star, I think you get the picture. Um, a, a lot of additional analyses I can do on my sets uh, with the Ray Star. Um, you may or may not have to go to that level. Again, SeqMan does a lot of nice analysis. If you have smaller experiments, SeqMan may provide all that uh, information that you need. So I guess I'd like to, I know there's a number of questions here, so I'd like to wrap up here uh, with the presentation. So thanks again for joining me. Um, I know that there's lots of questions coming in about different types of assemblies. Um, I'm sure we'll have additional webinars in the future to focus on different types of workflows. Um, if you're interested in the software, we do have fully functional demos that you can try out. Um, I schedule one-on-one -on -one webinars all the time. And so if you have a different type of workflow that we didn't cover, you know, I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you set up a webinar at your convenience, and, and, uh, and we can discuss your project then. So thanks again, and I'll take some more questions here. Um, we're getting just about out of time, so I'm just going to ask uh, one question, which is, is it possible or beneficial to use a partial reference sequence if you don't have the whole genome to work with? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one thing that we, we will do here is take a genome package and cut it down to just a single chromosome. Um, you can cut it down further and use GenBank files, or it might just be a small amplicon that you're interested in. Um, so yeah, we can use all sorts of uh, reference sequences. Great. Thank you. And uh, as we said before, we'll follow up with any, anyone whose questions we didn't get to. I see a lot of um, technical questions coming in. And as Matt said, we do offer one-on-one -on -one webinars, so we can certainly help you with your projects. And we have a couple more webinars coming up in July. Uh, on July 11th, we have a webinar going over our Laser Gene Core Suite analysis tools. And then we'll have another Laser Gene Genomics Suite webinar on July 18th. 